welcome to our series on flex and rigid flex. I'm Tara Dunn and in today's episode we are going to discuss tips for clearly communicating your design intent with your fabricator. I'm going to jump right in and say my number one absolute best tip for communicating your design intent is to over communicate with your fabricator. I can't stress that enough. Um, but before we get into how I think you could best do that, I want to make sure that everybody is aware of choosing the right fabricator for their design. Once you start moving into flex and rigid flex, there's a wide variety of technical capability out in the market. So you really want to pay attention to the fabricator that you're looking at. Take some time to learn what type of technology that they're working with. Are they working with just flex or just rigid flex? Um, simple technology or very complex HDI technology in the flex and rigid flex world. Another important question is what percentage of their business is flex and rigid flex? You want to make sure they're at least somewhere in the 10 to 25% range if they're doing a combination of flex and rigid. Just want to make sure that they have the experience that you're going to need to get the prototype that you are requiring. Um, a couple other questions I would recommend asking is what percentage of their business do they do that is quick turn versus standard delivery? If you have a prototype that you're going to need delivered in the fastest uh, amount of time possible, make sure that that fits with the fabricator's business model as well. And then finally, make sure that you're reviewing the quality certificates. Um, what's important to you? Is it ISO? Is it MIL cert, UL requirements, AS9100, NADCAP, you know, do the research with your fabricator. Make sure that you're really honing in and finding the best fit fabricator for your design. So once you've selected this fabricator, that is where the communication on the fab notes is going to take place. This is where I say over communicate. So the fab notes is probably the one place um, where almost all of your requirements are going to be communicated to your fabricator. Um, and it is often one of the more confusing documents that we see from the fabrication side. So the first thing that I want to point out is probably 75 to 80 percent of um, jobs that come in to be tooled for flex and rigid flex go on hold. And they go on hold for a variety of reasons. So we're just going to go through some of the common reasons today. Um, the first one is going to be materials. Um, materials can be um, hard to decipher in fab notes. Um, I'm always going to highly recommend that you work with your fabricator ahead of time to get a stack up. Um, find out what the common materials are, um, what those are going to be, and how you can best utilize those materials. And then have that clearly communicated either as part of the design package or as an image in the fab notes. Um, and believe it or not, I know you're going to laugh when I say this, but um, it is not uncommon to have the flex layers in a rigid flex not clearly labeled. So we all have to stop and go back and take a look at that. Um, so clearly communicate your stack up and your material requirements. The other thing that is left off um, of fav notes fairly often that I think is a very important piece um, to keep in mind with a rigid flex, especially, is strain relief. So adding a bead of epoxy here, as you can see, the, the line of epoxy in the interface between the rigid and the flex is very, very important. And that is one of those things that is maybe not necessarily a standard note in your fab package. So something to really keep in mind, it's going to help the reliability of your product. Um, another war story I can tell is UL requirements. Um, it's more common than you would think to have parts fail a burn test and you go back to try to investigate how did that happen only to find out that the assembly notes have a very, very clear UL requirement stated in that package. The fab notes, it's not included or not clear. Um, and what happens at a fabricator is often those assembly notes are separated out from the package and the fabricator is only seeing the fabrication piece in that and they're not generally going to default to UL, UL approved materials um, without being specified to do that. You might get lucky sometimes, it could happen, but more often than not it's not going to happen. It's going to cause some problems later. And this is one that is my challenge to designers is to how to clearly communicate. I don't think there's a great standard in the industry just yet on how to do this, so get creative and um, work with your fabricators on how to communicate how the product's going to be flexing in end use. The reason I say that is because fabricators are going to get the product in, in, in Gerber format. It's going to be a two-dimensional package. It's going to be build, building a two-dimensional product that ultimately is going to be used in three dimensions as it's flexing, bending, or folding. So the fabricator knows how it's going to be used in end use, and they're asked the question. They're going to be happy to give advice on how to maybe make it a little more robust for your design. For instance, um, grain direction on material matters in dynamically flexing or very tight bend radius. 
applications, and your fabricator can um, adjust the circuit on the panel to be having the flex go with the grain direction rather than against it. You know, and that, that's just one example. Otherwise, cross-hatching material, if it looks like it's going to be a little bit too tight, they could recommend that or recommend adding a stiffener if it looks like a component area could be interfering um, with, with the bending and folding of the application. So generally happy to ask as long as they know how the, how the end use is going to be, be played out. Um, the other piece of advice that I want to um, talk about is DFM. So design for manufacturability, I'm sure you know the designs are run through your DFM checks as course of design. But make sure that they're run through the fabricator's DFM. So they have their um, design for manufacturability guidelines set up through their tooling group. And nearly all fabricators um, at this point in time will run a quick kind of down and dirty DFM for you um, midway through the design or definitely at the quote, quote stage. And it might not catch everything, but it's going to catch the really big gotchas, probably 90 to 95% of the issues that are going to come out um, once you're ready to roll. And the, the whole idea for communicating, you know, even prior to the quotation stage, it's the fact that when you're running a prototype, it's generally on a very tight time frame. So you've got other people waiting, ready to assemble that board. Um, the more you can communicate clearly ahead of that, once the order's placed, um, things can go a lot more smoothly. So then moving on to the tooling process. So once you've placed your order, as you're placing the order, I would recommend asking your fabricator to allocate the material at that time. Often, if the material's in stock, that's not going to be a problem. Um, some fabricators will do this automatically for you. Some fabricators, you need to specify that, as it's typical practice to maybe not allocate the material until the tooling process is finished because the stack up could change during that process. But if time is critical, ask to have it allocated ahead of time. It's going to be well worth the risk if the material does change for you. Um, that said, I wanted to take a step back to prior to the PO. If you know that you have a long lead time material, say something's got four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks before that material is available, work with your fabricator and pre-order that material. So that lead time is um, being taken into account while you're finishing the design and hopefully you can time things out and once you're ready to release that product for prototyping material is available. So jumping back to after the order is placed, like I said, it's very, very common for questions to be asked um, at the tooling stage and some of those are very simple questions. Um, if you get an email with those questions and it's simple to answer via email, return that, that's great. But if the questions are a little bit more complex, um, I recommend asking to have a conference call set up right away. Um, it can go a lot faster to pull you know, three, four people together, go through all the issues at once, and um, get that job moving again. Very important to document that conversation just as you would on an email trail, but can really save a lot of time versus the email traffic going back and forth. And then if your job did go on hold, um, the other thing I always recommend is asking if that hold impacted the delivery date. You don't want to have any surprises when you've got your assembly line set up, ready to run this part, only to find out it's not arriving on the day you expected because there was some delays up front that didn't get quite clearly communicated. Um, and following along that, the other thing that I always like to recommend people do is do a status check during the lead time of that. Maybe call a couple of times, send an email, even easier, um, just to make sure that everything is running on schedule. In an ideal world, a fabricator is going to communicate with you the minute that they know um, something's not going to be on time, but things are busy, sometimes things fall through the crack. This way you can ensure that your job is going to be there, ready to assemble as you expect it to be. So just doing a real quick recap on um, what we talked about today is just ways that you can over communicate with your fabricator. Uh, make sure that your design intent is clearly communicated in your fab notes. Make sure that you're selecting the um, best fit fabricator for your design. And then once the order's placed, just a few tips and tricks to be able to help expedite that process. So I hope you found this information valuable today and please share this information with your colleagues and peers that may be interested. I hope you'll be able to join us for our next video in the series, which is gonna be SAP and MSAP, so semi-additive and modified semi-additive processing for new emerging technology. Mm -hmm.